Good afternoon. Get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please turn with me in your authorized version of the scriptures to James chapter 5. We're going to have a video here with a little instruction and in righteousness for us today at the Church of the Living God. This, this video is primarily intended for those who are saved, born again, converted of the Church of the Living God. But those of you who are not saved, um, try to learn a little something, if you can, about how to interact with one another. Um, recently, I saw a couple of videos that there's something off with them. There was something off with these videos that I watched. And um, I felt a real disconnect um, with the videos that I was watching from the one who made them. And a, a real disconnect. And that bothered me. That bothered me. And we're going to address that in a way that some of you might not be aware of or expecting. James chapter 5, this, uh, like I said, this is for our instruction in righteousness for the church of the living God, okay? James chapter 5, we will begin at verse 7 on to verse 11. James chapter 5, verses 7 on to verse 11. Yeah, 7 Eleven, right? <laughs> Brother. James chapter 5, verses 7 on to verse 11. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Now, verse 7, of course, is talking about the literal second coming of the Lord. Because remember, the book of James is written specifically for the Jewish people during the time of Jacob's trouble, as is the book of Hebrews. But there are things that cross dispensational lines. And there's a lot of instruction and righteousness for us to uh, learn from this, okay? But right there in verse 7, being patient for the second coming, you know, the coming of the Lord, behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth... Fruit of the earth, remember the fig tree, okay? And having long patient for patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Unlike what some of these charismatic devils, these Pentecostal devils like to tell you, uh, the latter rain, whenever you look into scripture, is always in reference unto the future fulfillment unto the children of Israel, okay? Verse 8. Be ye, plural, ye is plural, be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Obviously, because again, this is written for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Time of Jacob's trouble, seven years, okay? Seven years. So, they have to be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth <laughs> before the door, and he knocks. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. And for this time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, when those Jews finally ha are, wake up and realize that we, the church of the living God, have been telling them the truth all along, and this is God's perfect and errant, given by inspiration word, um, they're going to need patience. And as it says, hold your place here, in Romans chapter 15, like we addressed in the previous video, let's hit it again. Repetition is very good. 
Very good. Repetition is good. Romans 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, of the scriptures might have hope. Okay? Verse 10 in James chapter 5. Take, my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all of them. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Note the endure. Like it says in Matthew chapter 24, he who endures to the end, the same shall be saved. Why does he say that? Because that is written for the Jews during the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 24 is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. And during that time period, you have to endure to the end to be saved. Why? Because if you take the mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead, boop, you lose your salvation. Eternal security is not available during the time of Jacob's trouble unless you're one of the 144,000 Jews who are sealed. And if you're not one of them, guess what? You're kind of out of luck. Okay? Let's continue. Behold, we count them happy which endure. endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Pitiful and of tender mercy. Job. Our beloved Job. And that's why we're going to spend a majority of our time today is in the book of Job. Okay? Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to the book of Job. Go to Job chapter 1. Let's look at Job. Let's look at Job for his patience and enduring grief and suffering. Okay? Let's look at Job. Job chapter 1. Now, before we get going, Let's remember some very important things about Job, okay? We're going to be doing a lot of gleaning through the book of Job today. So like I said, get your authorized version of the scriptures and follow me along, okay? This isn't going to be an expository study at all or anything like that, no. But we're going to be doing some gleaning here, okay? Your, your scriptures are going to get a workout today. Hope you're hungry. Job chapter 1. Let's, let's remember something about Job. Let's look at Job chapter 1, verses 6 on to verse 8. Okay? Follow me along. I expect you to. And hey, I'm going to address you as though you are following me along, okay? Don't just sit there. Job chapter 1, verses 6 on to verse 8. Let's, before we go farther, remember this about Job. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan, the accuser of the brethren, came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord, and said, from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Get a load of this. Never forget this. It's important when looking at Job. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now hold up. Stop right there. Get, out, get a load of that. Who said that of Job? God, our Lord, Jesus Christ, our Father. Okay? Our Lord said that of Job. God said that of Job. God's testimony of Job himself. You talk about a well done, good and faithful servant. 
And also keep in mind, you know, in the book of Acts, with the sons of Sceva in Acts chapter 19, when that devil said to the sons of Sceva, who were trying to put upon him the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, they themselves were not saved. And the devil said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And here God, God testifies of Job that he's what? A perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. You're not going to get a better testimony than that. You're not going to get a better testimony than that. The Lord himself saying of Job. But look at verse 9. Then Satan, then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Like, yay, that's God said. Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren, what is he doing? He's accusing Job. And he basically will go on to accuse Job from verses 13 on to 19, and in one fell swoop, one right after another, one right after another in Job chapter 1, verses 13, verse 19, Satan says, like he says in uh, Job, 9, uh, Job 1, verse 9, let's read from verse 10. Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And look what, look at what uh, the Lord says to Satan. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. So Satan needed permission to go after Job. And for us today, the church of the living God, um, for Satan to go after us, he needs permission from the Lord. And if the Lord has given him permission, uh, you need to consider why. You need to consider why. You need to seek the Lord on these things. But from verses 13 on to verse 19... In a succession of four, one, two, three, four, one right after another. Job has all of his tangibles taken away. First thing he loses, he loses his oxen, okay? He loses his oxen in verse 14. The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. He loses those. What does that mean in him losing that? The oxen were plowing, losing his food. His sustenance. Second thing he loses is his sheep. Okay? Uh, let's see. In verse 16, the fire of God has fallen from heaven, burned up the sheep. So the first thing he lost was the oxen plowing, his food. The second thing he loses is sheep, sheep for clothing and to keep warm and stuff like that. And also, the third thing that he lost was his income, his trade. Maybe he was trading in sheep or, or in um, um, produce or something like that. But the camels also, in verse 17, the third thing that he lost was his income through trading the camels because, okay, the oxen with the asses were plowing in the field. Satan attacked that. He lost his food. Then the sheep, his clothing, and also the sheep, the sheep shearing and whatnot, probably uh, attributed onto his income, the camels where the Chaldeans made three bands and fell upon the camels and carried away all the stuff, went after that, his, his livelihood, his income. So, so far, Job in one fell swoop lost his food, his clothing, and his income. And then his sons and daughters were drinking, eating and drinking, in their brother's house, and then the winds of God smote the four corners, and it boom, collapsed on the on them all, killed all his children. You and I think we have it hard sometimes, don't we, brethren? But you 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 really need to consider, in one fell swoop. Okay, see, God is usually pretty gracious with us. Because he'll he'll see we'll see things coming sometimes, and if we don't, he he has mercy on us. 
But this, Satan was given, go ahead, but don't touch him. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and see my servant Job. So Satan takes his food, his clothing, his money, and his children. So killing his children, what does that mean? His legacy, his family, those who will carry on his name. So one, two, three, four, just like that. One guy was speaking, another came, another came, another came. You talk about when it rains, it pours, brother, sister. He lost everything. Food, clothing, money, and family. And if I'm not mistaken, isn't that a big to-do with so many today? Food, clothing, money, family. Unfortunately, they put it, Money, <laughs> clothing, food, family. <laughs> we think we got it rough sometimes, huh? But see, after all of that, Job chapter 1, verses 20 on to verse 22. After all this, our instruction on righteousness, how many of us can do this? Then Job arose and rent his mantle, <coughs> tore it, and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshiped. One, two, three, four. Lost his food, his clothing, his money, his legacy. Boom, 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 boom. And he falls down on the ground and worships. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return hither. Thither, excuse me. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor char charged God foolishly. And looking at verse 21, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. First Timothy. Of course. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6 verses 1 on to verse 10. First Timothy chapter 6 verses 1 on to verse 10. Remember what Job lost. Boom, 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 boom. Falls down on the ground and worships. Let as many, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 on verse 10. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. And if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Godliness is what? It's being separated. Okay? Okay? There are those out there, um, these weird hyper-dispensationalists who actually are not dispensational at all, uh, like to kind of say, ah, no, stay away from the red words. Doctrinally, before the death, burial, and resurrection, yeah, doctrinally, a lot of it does not apply. But instruction in righteousness. See, we as the church of the living God, we don't just stay within the Pauline epistles. That's our doctrine for today, absolutely. But see, you, here's, here's the whole sandwich. Take the whole sandwich. Now, there's a little part of it that's specifically for you. But here, here's the whole sandwich, Okay. We're to encompass all of Scripture. But you have to remember, doctrinally, what applies for us today in this dispensation is specifically within the Pauline epistles, okay? The book of Acts is transitioning from the old onto the new, okay? It was a transition book. Just like Hebrews is, okay? Kind of like Exodus is, okay? And Joshua is, okay? You get it? Let's continue. Let's read verse 3 again. 
If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. And the strife of words you see in many different ways. Um, the one that I've always likened it onto was strifes of words. Well, a better translation would be the the Greek says this, yeah, the or the Hebrew says that. That's one. But also infiltrators. You'll say this, 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 and then they'll pick on this one seemingly out of place word, and then focus on that and attack that. Okay. They'll focus on this one word, and then they'll make a big to-do, blowing it all out of proportion. Okay? And those who do that, what, do that, what does that cause? Envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. You said this. Well, okay, okay I, I used that word, but look at what was being said in a whole. But no, they'll pick out just one phrase, one word. And they will do that in order to create envy, strife, railings, and evil surmisings. Oh, I've seen that in comments. People have emailed me. You said this, this. You said this word in this one video. Okay, but did you listen to the whole video? What was being said? Did you listen to the whole context? Y'all never really respond when I have responded back to you with that. You never did. So... Come on. But anyway, anyway. Verse 5. Perverse disputing of men of corrupt minds. Why are their minds corrupt? And destitute of the truth. Supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. Gain is godliness. Now, right away, what do you think of? Think of the money. But gain could be stuff. Gain can be your own little following. Gain can be the applauses of men. Gain can be clothing. Gain can be food. Gain is not just relegated to the money, people. You, you, you got to think a little bit broader than that when it comes to gain is godliness, okay? It's not just money, okay? Covetousness, covetousness, well, the love, let's continue. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Verse 7, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness being separated, being other than that. See, there are those out there It's like, well, if I just get enough of this, if I just get enough people uh, following me, if I just get enough money to buy whatever, then I'll have godliness be separate because look at me, look at me. I got a big following. I got a lot of money. I could do all this. People give me praise. I got godliness because of the accoutrements that surround me. But what does Paul say? But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And look what he says here. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Food and raiment. Literally, food and raiment, yes. But also, food and raiment. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And being clothed with humility, the righteousness of Christ. How do you learn that stuff? Through the scriptures. See, there's a dual meaning to 
to that. Yes, literally, having food and raiment, let us be, uh, there with, let us be there with content. Absolutely, literal. Yes, but it's more than just that. It is more than just that. If you have the scriptures, you got clothes, you got a full belly. Anything else is a luxury. The fact that my wife and I have been, our Lord, praise our Lord Jesus Christ uh, for him, uh, for what he's done to all of you. Thank you so much for all of you. Thank the Lord for you. But it's a luxury that we have what we have here. Okay? Because what we're told is to have food and raiment, let us be there with content. Because we ain't taking nothing out. See, we're supposed to be content with what we have. Because our Lord said he would never leave us or forsake us. Before we continue, go to Hebrews chapter 13. Okay? Go to Hebrews chapter 13. Like I said, this, this is for our instruction in righteousness. I know fine brethren, fine saints, fine saints who live that better than most. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 on to verse 5. Let's reread in 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verses 6 on to verse 8. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Contentment. You know, someone who's content and wants nothing other than righteousness, if you don't want much of this kind of stuff, your life is going to be a lot better. <laughs> I can guarantee you. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 on to verse 5. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. How many of you nowadays would have a stranger in your home and feed them? Granted, granted, let's be realistic. There are a lot of whack jobs out there. <laughs> There's a lot of guys that, woo -hoo, that are crazy out there. Yes, there are. Yes, there are. Amen. But what if you were wearing their shoes? You don't like to think about that, do you? Hmm? See, some people will get to such a point where their godliness will remove them from being relatable, being approachable. And that's something I fear, brethren. That's something I fear. I don't ever want to be unapproachable. I don't ever want to get to a point where I have, I'm unrelatable, you know? We're poor people. The Lord Jesus Christ, through you, the Church of the Living God, keeps us where we are at. And without him, through you, all is lost, okay? We know what it's like to be dirt poor. We know what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. We don't forget that. And with what our Lord has given us, oh, like I, I told my best friend, um, our beloved brother Alexander Hartley, I told him yesterday, you know, brother, if you ever see me, I mean, I have a pride problem, by the way. I do. I have a big pride problem. And it's a daily struggle, Okay. It's a daily struggle. The Lord allowed me to have a heart problem to keep me humble. Also, the prayers of the saints to keep me humble and whatnot. Okay, but I do. I have a pride problem. And praise the Lord that there are brethren out there who, when they see that, they'll be like, Brad, no, I love you. Yeah. You need to check yourself. Why? Give me a scripture. It's like... Thank you, Lord. How many of you do that? How many of you are, you know, you know, down to earth as it is? I don't ever want to be one of those who, you know, I don't want to be unrelatable to you, the Church of the Living God. And there are those out there who are because they've been elevated. 
and they forgot from whence they came. It's like there are some people of the church of the living God and these Christians who been there, done that, you know? And then if you were to meet them on the street, it would be like, and you're, you're of the church of the living God. So are they supposedly. But yet two different worlds. You know what I'm saying? Let's continue this. Verse 3. In Hebrews chapter 13. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them. And them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as ye have. Why? For he has said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. Back in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. Verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Just got to get more and more, some of you, don't you? Even in times like this, can you be content with what you have and not want? Hi, I'm speaking to myself too. Let's continue in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, the big ones. But they that will be rich, rich, again, does not always denote just mammon. You could be rich in the, the books. You can be rich in land. You can be rich in apparel. You can be rich in provision. You can be rich in friends. You can be rich in people following you. It's not just the money. But... But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish, foolish living as if there is no God and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. How can the love of money be the root of all evil? Okay. Money was instituted for man after the fall. Or after, yeah, after the fall, okay? Money was not needed. There's a part in the book of Isaiah, come, eat, uh, drink uh, drink wine without money or without price. Uh, one of you put that, please, in the description box for me. I can't think about it. Or in the comment, and I'll, uh, okay, please. But in Isaiah, where he's like, come, eat, drink without money and without price. Why do you spend your money on things that are not profitable or things that are not food? See, when the love of money, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. Money in and of itself is not evil, but it's when you love it, when you love it, when you covet it. That's evil. Why? Because the love of money, which is the root of all evil, leads on to what? Leads on to pride. It leads on to self-sufficiency. It leads to covetousness. But number one, it leads to pride. And pride, I think, is one of our Lord's most grievous sins that he hates. Look at Satan, Lucifer. Pride got him done, kicked out of heaven, and he became the uh, accuser of the brethren. Okay? <laughs> okay? Yeah. I have known these Christians who are millionaires. And to be honest with you, uh, before, before I say any more, I don't think they're saved. There is one who is a Christian. He's been a Christian for 25 years. And I'm not talking about you, you weirdo from England. I'm not talking about you. Okay? But another guy who was a Christian for 25 years. And he's a millionaire. And you know what? He's the first one to tell you.
And see, these types of people who are Christians, I want to tell you, just here, God has blessed me so much. Look at how much I have. While you're sitting there in your own done, basically. Why is it when some people come across people who are suffering in misery, they, want, they seem to want to boast themselves of what the Lord has done for them to someone who is in need? I don't get that. I don't understand that. I don't. And I, I take great offense to that. I really do. I really do. You know, someone, your brother or sister, you know what? Sometimes they just want to be heard. Sometimes, you know what? You, you know what? You need to just shut your mouth and just be there for them. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at that. But no, see, sometimes some people will get, oh, well, I'm going to, I'm going to really help this guy out by, you know, hey, I'll even quote to you some scripture. Which is a good thing. But see, why are they doing it? Because, remember, uh, the way to hell is paved with good intentions. Sometimes, brethren, some of the best things you can do with someone who... And I've been through this a lot. I've been through this a lot. Sometimes the best thing you can do for someone who is suffering is shut your mouth and be there. Let them cry on you. Oh, but you're a touch freak, right? Right? You, again, I've asked this to you before. Are you approachable? Huh? Or is your godliness set you so far that you're holier than thou? What does the Lord say of that? That's also in Isaiah. That you're a smoke in his nostrils. You irritate him. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted, there it is, coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Because the love of money leads to what? Covetousness. Covetousness needs, leads to what? That's pride. Think about it. Because if you're coveting something, you want it for me, 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 I, 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 me, me, me. Right? That's how it's the root of all evil. Now go back now and see, Satan was accusing Job because Job had been blessed and he had all this stuff, right? And like we looked at already, one, two, three, four. Job lost his food, his raiment, his money, and his family. One, two, three, four. And he fell on the ground and worship. These, these Christians who are millionaires, the first thing to tell you, it's like, oh, uh, Oh, I, I'm, I've lost so much. God gave me another thousand dollars yesterday that I could... It's like, shut up, you pond scum. Shut up. Shut up. Well, you're supposed to uh, glory with those. Yes, you are. But have a little tact. Yes, have a little tact. Have a little compassion. Makes me sick. Makes me sick. Now go back to Job. Go back to Job. Job chapter 2 now. You know, I, over the years I've, I've learned to be quiet and let the Lord do his work for those who are in sin. But when it comes to certain stuff like this, I really lose my patience. I really lose my patience. Now, we saw how after Job lost everything, one, two, three, four, all his tangible stuff. He fell down, what is it, in Job 1, verse 21, or verse 20, Then Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So stuff wasn't important to him. I mean, it was, but God was more important because he knew that it came from God. Job chapter 2 now. Now, after all this, Job chapter 2, verses 1 on verse 3. Again, there was a day when the sons of God, angels, angels, came to present themselves before the Lord. 
And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Pay attention. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect man, a perfect and an upright man, excuse me, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Again, God, our Father, giving that testimony of Job. Remember that. But also remember this. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him. Don't look at me. Without cause. Without cause. Without cause. God, number one, says of Job, He's a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. And he did that to Job without cause. Because Satan's like, you bless this guy. Take it all away. See where his loyalty lies. Where his love really lies. Most who are Christian, and unfortunately I do believe most who are of the church and living God, that love for our Lord will be greatly challenged if this get taken away. I know of a dear brother in Croatia who's going through un incredible suffering, but yet he has a heart like Job. He does. He really does. Um, he understands what Paul was talking about there in Timothy. You know? Pray for this brother in Croatia too. He lives amongst Catholics, and um, if I could, if I could, I would help this brother. Okay, but he, he's a good example of this. He's he is, you know, he's a really good example of this. He's one that uh, he's a perfect man, one who fears God and shoes e evil. Perfect meaning his heart is right. But anyway, about Job, God said of him. That he was a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and sheweth evil. And he didn't have a cause for allowing Satan to do that. Because Satan accused him of being concerned about his stuff. Like these Christians. My father is a millionaire. He's a Christian. Right. Yeah, he is a Christian. And he's the first one who would tell you that he's a millionaire. What happens if all that money goes away? trembling new Christian Christian what happens when the rug is taken out from under you church of the living God what happens when the rug is taken out from under you we had our rug taken out from under us when we lived over at that house lost my secular job okay lost the house we, 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 I, granted I was like oh I was pretty scared Lord's like, see, the Lord took everything away so he could put me where he wants me here today, brother, answering your question. He took, he took many things away from me in order to show me what he wanted me to do. Hope that answers your question, brother. But... Now look at verse 4. Job obviously wasn't about his stuff. But see, there are also those out there who, even though they lose their stuff, verse 4, And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Skin for skin. Ah, yes. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he will curse thee to thy face and that's very appropriate because remember Satan is all about what Fle excuse me Satan is all about what flesh the skin suit yeah 
Yeah, so Satan here, it's like, okay, yeah, you let me take away his... But let me touch him personally. When it gets personal, Jack. I can lose my house, my wife, my car, my job, my food, everything, but I got my health. What happens if you don't have your health? And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand. But save his life, don't kill him. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot onto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all and sat down among the ashes. <laughs> and just to add insult to injury, verses 9 and 10. You sisters out there, take a little advice here. Then said his wife unto him, okay, Job lost what? He lost his food, he lost his clothing, he lost his money, he lost his children. Now Satan's taken away his health, and now his own wife is turning against him. This Job is quite, was quite a man. How do we measure up? Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Eve was made for Adam, not Adam for Eve. Proverbs 21, verse 9. It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. Verse 19 in Proverbs 21. It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. And... Proverbs 27, verses 15 on to verse 16. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whosoever hideth her hideth the wind and the ointment of his right hand which bereath itself. You, beloved sisters, you ponder on that. But let's continue in Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Talk about when it rains, it pours, huh? But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. Look at this. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? He must increase, and I must decrease. In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Take, take this away from me. Take my everything. Take my health. Turn my wife against me? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. And all this did not Job sin with his lips. So, let's recap. Note. Number one. He lost what? He lost his food. The oxen plowing the field. He lost his sheep, clothing, and also his income because of the camels. They attacked the camels who were going probably to trade. So he loses his food, his raiment, his income, and his children, his health. And his wife turns against him. How many digits am I holding up here? Six. That's not a coincidence. And then all that... And all those things, 
in a very bam, 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 just like that. Job lost everything. And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now, now here, here comes some people wanting to comfort Job. Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Or Zophar, Zophar, Zohar, excuse me. Verses 11 on to verse 13. Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that was come upon him, they came every one from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar, Zophar the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come to mourn with him and to comfort him. If anyone needed comforting. And when they lifted up their eyes afar off and knew him not, they lifted up their voice and wept, and they rent every one his mantle and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. Verse 13. So they sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Just actually being there. You know, sometimes, brethren, people, when someone's going through something, the fact you just physically being there, and I beg your pardon, I, I've, I, I have experience, quite a bit of experience with this, with people who have lost uh, loved ones, just be there for them. Those who have lost their, their job or their, their wife runs off with another woman. Just be there. Just be there for them. Shh, shut up. They ask of you. That's, that's a different story. But see, now in Job chapter 3, which we're not going to read, Job chapter 3, he starts lamenting. Okay? He starts lamenting about these things. He starts lamenting. And, and again, looking at Job chapter 2 about how his three friends came and just sh shut up and didn't say anything. And then in Job chapter 3, he was lamenting with his friends there. And his friends didn't say anything yet. Go to Romans chapter 12. Okay? Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Romans 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now hold on. When you are in the presence of someone who is suffering, who is in misery, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. If you've been of the Church of the Living God for years and years and years and years, and then you're in the presence of someone who's suffering, you know what? You of all people, those of you who have been saved for uh, a while, y'all ought to know yourselves to shut up. Speak, unless, uh, speak only when spoken to, okay? Not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. It's like, oh, I'll let this guy cry a little while, then let him do his thing, and then I'll come in with some real wisdom, and I'll just cheer him up and edify him. Verse 4. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. 
having then gift, gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesy, or whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry, ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that sheweth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor. Abhor means extreme hatred. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. And there is none good but one. That is who? God. Okay? Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Again, context, this is between the church and the living God. Context, not specific, not about you lost people, okay? This is in context for the church and the living God, okay? Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love and the honor preferring one another. Preferring one another. Don't hang out with lost people. Brother, I can't get a hold of you. I'm worried about you. Don't hang out with lost people. Okay? Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another. Remember, God is a God of distinction. Those being with their own kind. We're, we're to be out in the world, but we're not of the world, remember. Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. When it comes to fellowship, hanging out, uh, church of the living God, you be with your own kind. Those who are saved. Okay? We got to go out in the world and do things in the world. We're not of the world. Okay? We're out there to be ambassadors for Christ. Okay? But brethren... How's it going with you having lost friends and you're being around them? Cleaves to you, doesn't it? Like dung on the bottom of your shoe, right? You know, be holy, separate, godly, other than that. Okay? We're supposed to prefer one another. Look, I want to be with my own kind. Those who are of the church of the living God. Okay? I don't want to hang out with people who are lost. I'll go and talk with them. Absolutely. But hanging out, fellowship, fellowship. Um, what fellowship can light have with darkness? Christ with Belial. Okay? Let's continue. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the greed of saints. You weren't expecting that, were you? Distributing to the necessity of saints. Wants are many. Needs are full. Our needs are few. God will provide your need. I'm here to tell you. Given to hospitality. Hospitality. How many of you are given to hospitality? Well, nowadays you can't... Okay, I'll give you that to an extent. But remember, some have entertained angels unawares. Given to hospitality. Granted, nowadays it's not like it used to be. Um, you can't just bring everybody into your home, but you can still, without doing that, you can still show ho um, hospitality. And see a lot with this insane Jesuitical um, uh, psychological operation that they created with their ridiculous social distancing. People are afraid to have contact one with another. Get close, okay? Yeah. How are we doing in the hospitality department? 
by the way. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Oh, thank you for insulting me. Thank you for attacking me. Oh, thank you for looking into my background to try to find things to attack me with which are stupid and doesn't mean anything. Oh, thank you. No, that's not what it means. That's not what that means. Bless them which persecute you. Bless them? How do you bless those who persecute you? Give them an example of godliness by the way you uh, react, the way you behave. Uh, bless them by living the truth of Scripture before them who attack you, by giving them the Scriptures, by presenting to them the truth of the Scriptures. That's how you bless those who persecute you. You bless them by giving them an example of how someone of the Church of the Living God will react and go and undergo persecution. You give them the Scripture. You tell them the truth. That's how you bless those who persecute you. You don't be, oh, thank you so much for attacking me like you do. No, 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 no. No. Okay? No. No. Paul was not a sadist. A sadist. And neither is our Lord Jesus Christ God our Father. God forbid. Okay? Let's continue. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them with weep. And weep with them that weep. If one is uh, doing well, we're all doing well. If one is hurting, we're all hurting. But you're selective, aren't you? There are, there are brethren out there who I don't like. Who don't like me. But to find out that they're suffering and they're my brother. I don't like them. I love them. They're my brother. We don't talk to one another. We can't. We, we butt heads. Okay, whatever. That's flesh. But, you know, like like my brother in Canada. I mean, he, he's suffering daily. We don't talk to each other. <laughs> okay? Rejoice with them that, rejoice, that do rejoice and weep with them with weep. Are you selective to those only who you like? What about that brother of yours that you have a total disagreement? Hi. Do you still find time to pray for that brother? Even though you don't like one another? Hey, what if that brother who you don't like and doesn't like you got a hold of you all of a sudden out of nowhere? It's like, hey, I need you to pray for me. Please pray for me. Would you do it? Or would you just give lip service and say, oh yeah, I'll pray for you. Now. See, when my wife and I say that we pray for you, we pray for you. Okay? How about you? How about you? Be of the same mind one toward another, having the mind of Christ. Having your mind on heavenly things, not on earthly things. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Oh, right there. Right there. Right there. Okay. I know you watch these. Would you be willing to go and embrace a stranger, a homeless guy? Huh? Would you be willing to go and sit amongst the homeless who stink? Huh? Would you be willing to do that? Or are you holier than thou? Don't come near me because I am holier than thou. You're unclean, unclean. Are you high in your, what is it, uh huh? Are you wise in your own conceits? It says here to condescend to men of low estate. That means that we are to go to the outcasts. We are to go to those who are downtrodden. We are to go to the lowly. We are to go to the little guy. Remember, God is a God of the little guy. Didn't, haven't you figured that out by now, right? God's a God of the little guy? You know, like Catholics say, well, if Jesus had a church, it would be the biggest and best one. Oh, go pound some sand. No, he wouldn't. <laughs> the church of the living God is very small. There are a million Christians out there. Millions of Christians. Very few were of the church of the living God. Very few. 
Do you condescend the men of low state? Or because of your position, are you too high and mighty? Hmm? Because you, you, you have so many men praising you, can you take the time to go to someone huh, who is down on their luck? How, ma how many of you? How many of you? you go buy some homeless man. Granted, you don't give a homeless man cash outright. No, you don't. No, you don't. Okay? Been burning on that one myself. No, but what do you do? Hey, let's go get a bite to eat. You hungry? You want some food? Let's go. Well, you need some clothes? Come on, let's go to Walmart. Y'all get you a t-shirt or a pair of shoes or something. Would you do that? Or just say, oh, I'll pray for you. Give them gospel track. Oh, that's, you know. Would you go the extra step? Hmm? You know, if someone who is homeless, I, I'm using the homeless as an example because they're a perfect example. You know, someone who is homeless, you offer them food and they take you up on it and you get to sit there and eat with them and actually take out the scriptures in a controlled environment, you know, in a restaurant or something or in your car or whatever and get to talk with them while over a meal. Works. Works well. But are you too upper echelon to condescend to men of low estate? Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now that does not mean living peaceably that you go against the scriptures. Perfect example. There are those out there who will use this in argument to get the steel of the Jesuit poniard that you can live peaceably with all men. Get the steel of the Jesuit poniard and all this stuff is totally contrary to scripture. We choose scripture. Okay? But as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. They don't want peace. You know, I am for peace, like it saw, says in one, uh, Psalm 120. Let's go there. Hold your place here. Psalm 120. Psalm 120. Okay? Very quick. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to finish the psalm before this video time limit is up. Okay? Psalm 120. In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given unto thee? Or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Sharp arrows of the mighty, with coals of juniper. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshach, that I dwell in the tents of Kedar. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth, hateth peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Oh, how many times have you come across that? You be with someone and you just try to speak peaceably, but yet when I speak, they're for war. <laughs> My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. You live with someone who's lost, uh, who's not for peace. Uh. Verse 19 in uh, Romans 12. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. It's not up to you to get even. Now this is not condoning this disgusting um, pacifism. Okay, pacifism. Okay, that's this is not a promoting pacifism. Not at all. Not at all. Okay, self-defense, defending your family, Okay, absolutely, already covered that, okay? But, you know, getting even, got to get even. It's not up to you to get even. The Lord will repay, okay? Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Want the scriptures? Can I... Can I pray with you? Can I share some of the uh, word of God with you? If he thirsts, give him drink. 
For in doing, for in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So in a situation where the Lord has orchestrated for you or I to be a comforter unto someone, it will do us well to remember Romans chapter 12. Okay? It will do us well to remember that. But now, go back to Job. Go back to Job. Now, Job chapter 3, like, like I said, Job is just openly venting. Okay? And rightfully so. He was lamenting. He was um, lamenting his, uh, his plight. Okay? Six things happened to him in a quick succession. Okay? He lost his food, his clothing, his money, his children, his health, and his wife. He had some things to lament. His, his three friends in Job chapter 2, verses 11 and 13, started out good. But something happened. Something happened. Job chapter 4. Job chapter 4. Eliphaz. Now, remember, what did we read about Job? God allowed Satan to do this. Look at Job chapter 2, verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man? God said that of Job. One that feareth God and escheweth evil. And still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Remember that. Job God did this, allowed Satan to do this to him without cause. Without cause. What does his three friends do when they open their mouth? What do they do? Job 4, verses 1, under verse 8. Then Alphaz the Temanite answered and said, If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Look at that arrogance. Looking at your, your poor friend, I'm going to pity you. I mean, yeah, I should keep my mouth shut. They should have kept their mouth shut. They were doing it right in chapter 2, verses 11 on to verse 13 for seven days. But I, I got to say something to you. I just got to give you my two cents. But who can withhold himself from speaking? You poor thing. Remember. Remember. There was no cause for our Lord allowing Satan to do this. There was no cause. Remember that. Okay. But Eliphaz just had to get his two cents in. Just like Bildad and so far. Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholden him that was falling, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. Flattery. Pay attention to how this is being done. I can't with... I, 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 gotta, I gotta say something, right? Flattery. Verse 5. But now it has come upon thee, and thou faintest. So much for flattery. It toucheth thee, and thou art troubled. Accusation. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope, and the uprightness of thy ways? Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or, were, or where were the righteous cut off? Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. Now hold on. We know this isn't true. Because verse 3 in chapter 2, without cause, there was no cause for Satan to do this to him. God said it himself. And right here, beginning at verse 5 on to verse 8, Elphaz accuses Job. And remember, look at look at how this is constructed. Elphaz, I got to say something, okay? I was doing good. I should, I should just shut up. Job lamented. And instead of just... You know, being quiet, he's like, after Job lamented, Elphaz had to open his big mouth 
It's like, well, I, I, I got to say something. Who can refrain him? So look at you, you poor thing. You had to have done something, you know. Look, verses 3, on to verse 4. Flattery. You've done good. You're a good guy. You've done all this. But, but, see, the accusation. And we know this accusation is false. How do you know? Verse 3 in Job chapter 2. He should have kept his mouth shut. But no, he couldn't refrain himself. And then look at how he does it. He's like, he has to justify himself. Then he uses flattery. And then from that flattery, accusation. False accusation. But his intention was good. Yeah, and you read what he says. It's good. But see, it was done in a false pretense. See, it was done falsely. Even though what he was saying was good, he did it in a false notion, a false pretense, because he thought Job had done something. Granted, they did not know, but see, they should have kept their mouth shut. But they didn't. A little high-minded were they. When someone was suffering, Job of all people. Get what I'm saying so far? Now, go to Job chapter 8. Then Job answers, it's like, hey, dude, I know this kind of stuff, okay? Go to Job chapter 8. Alphaz made an accusation, one of his uh, one of his three friends. What about this Bildad? Bildad. Uh, Job chapter 8, verses 1 on verse 10. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite and said, How long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? Starts out with an accusation right there, right then and there. Okay? Starts out with it. It's like, dude, shut up. You're, you're, you're lying. and you're, you're just talking. Doth God pervert judgment or doth the Almighty pervert justice? Look at this dig out on Job. Look at this dick. And remember, if you were to read Job chapter 1, Job often did uh, offerings and sacrifices for his kids in case they had unknowingly sinned against God. Okay? But look at this dig. Dig on Job here by Bildad, one of his friends. And didn't Jesus call Judas friend? Look at this dig on Job. If thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgressions. If thy children have sinned against him, and he have cast them away for their transgression, if thou wouldst seek unto God betimes, and make thy supplication to the Almighty. Accusation again. If thou wert pure and upright, surely now he would awake for thee, and make the habitation of thy, righteous, of thy righteousness prosperous. And we know that's not true because what did God say of, the, uh, of Job? That he was perfect and upright and feared God and shoot evil. And there was no cause for him allowing Satan to attack him. But yet, build that here. Deserved to be, shut up! But he was one of his friends. He had his great, I mean, if you were to read again, what Bildad says after his False accusation of Job. See, spoken to him in a false pretense. He says good things, but spoken in a false pretense. Accusing Job. Job was innocent. God said so. And he starts out with an accusation. And then digs on him about his kids. And then says that you're not pure and upright. When God said that he was upright and feared God and eschewed evil. And without cause... Satan was allowed to do this to him. But their intentions were good. And like I said, you read what Bildad says, it's good. It's good. But what made it bad was that it was said in a pre uh, wrong in a false pretense. Okay? That's what made it bad. Even though what he was saying was good. Is that making sense to you? Let's continue. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. And that does happen to Job, obviously. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, 
and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. For we are but of yesterday, and know nothing, because our days are upon, uh, upon earth are a shadow. Shall not they teach thee and tell thee, and utter words out of their heart? See, that's truth. But see, he falsely accused Job. And we know Job was innocent. We just had to open his mouth. Because Elphaz did it. Why not me? Now go to go to Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. Verses 1 and verse 12. Here's Zophar. So, Elphaz falsely accuses him and kind of digs on him. Uh, Bildad with his kids really digs on him. Accuses him falsely. What about his other friend who just had to open his mouth? Then answered so far the Namathite and said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? And should a man full of talk be justified? Accusing Job right there. It's like just ba 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 <laughs> well, These were the guys who should have kept their mouth shut. Should thy, should thy lies make men hold their peace? And when thou mockest, shall no man make thee ashamed? So calling Job a liar and call, accusing him of mocking. So far said he wasn't pure and upright. Eliphaz is like, you sinned somewhere. But we know about Job that that wasn't the case. For thou hast said, my doctrine is pure. I am clean in thine eyes. But oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee. Think about the stupidity of that statement that he just said there. God said that he was innocent. And that he would shew thee the secrets of wisdom, that they are double to that which is. Know therefore that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserveth. Canest thou by searching find out God? Canest thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canest thou do? Deeper than hell. What canest thou know? This is truth. The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, who can hinder him? True! That's true! But the pretense that he's been saying this, he's speaking truth, but yet he's using it almost as a weapon, isn't he? As his three friends do. Speaking truth in a false pretense. For he knoweth vain men, he seeketh, he seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? Oh, wait, wait. Did we read 10? If, let's read verse 10 again. If he cut off and shut up or gather together, who then who can hinder him? For he knoweth vain men. He seeth wickedness also. Will he not then consider it? For vain man would be wise, though man be born like a wild ass's colt. And then verse 13. If thou prepare thine heart, and stretch out thine hands toward him. Verse 14. If iniquity be in thine hands, put it far away, and let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. See, he's speaking truth, but it began with false accusation, false pretense. And these were his friends. But now, what, what was going on here? Go to Jeremiah chapter 9. Check this out. Jeremiah chapter 9. These guys were speaking truth. Granted, they didn't know about the discourse between him and Satan. Between God and Satan. Excuse me. Okay? They didn't know that. But see, they started out right. But they opened up their mouths and had to just start da 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 da. Okay? What's going on here? Jeremiah chapter 9. Verses 23 on to verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, 
and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Well, what they were saying, didn't that kind of line up with that? Yes, it did. But see, they were falsely accusing Job. They were falsely accusing Job. So the question is, did, did Elphaz, Bildad, and Zophar know of God? Know of God? Or did they know God? Because Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Verses 9 and 10. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And you got to remember something, too. you got to remember something. Okay? Remember this. Remember this. Job chapter 32. Job chapter 32. Okay? Job chapter 32, verses 1 on to verse 9. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Now see, by the time you get to chapter 32, Job was so vexed by the constant barrage by his three friends that he ended up boasting and getting a little cocky. He did. You read uh, chapter 31. Job was starting to leave. That's when the Lord's like, Who is this that speaketh words without knowledge? He was not addressing Elihu. He was addressing Job. Elihu gets skipped over in the judgment of God. God just kind of, you know. But look at what Elihu says. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barachel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled, because he justified himself rather than God. And in Job chapter 31, yes, you see that. But see, Job was brought, and see, Job, Job did that in Job chapter 31. But see, the constant barrage that he was receiving from his three friends, okay, that's what brought that about. Job, Job was guilty at this point by doing exactly that. He was. Why? Not an excuse, but why? Because he was being constantly barraged by the attacks of his three friends. And Job ended up speaking words without knowledge. And hence our Lord finally was like, okay, I'm going to question you now. Okay? So, let's continue. Also against his three friends was his wrath kindled because they had found no answer and yet had condemned Job. Now Elihu had waited till Job had spoken because they were elder than he. When Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, then his wrath was kindled. And Elihu the son of Barachel, the Buzite, answered and said, I am young and ye are very old. Wherefore I was afraid, and durst not shew you mine opinion. I said, Days should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. More on that in a second. But there is a spirit in man, the spirit of man, and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth, giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise. How true is that? Neither do the aged understand judgment. Look at verse 7. I said days should speak and multitude of years should teach wisdom. Why is it out there that you see older women um, who are in their 60s trying to look as if they're 20? Why is it you see older men in their 50s trying to look like one of these millennials? Why in the Christian church buildings hmm, these elders keep trying to get younger and younger and they have the mindset to try to be like the world to win the world because we've got to win the kids? 
How many who are true elders of the Church of the Living God get puffed up with their been there, done that mentality and are boasting in their longevity? Oh, I've done this for so long. I've been doing this for many, many years. You haven't. Well, that may be true. Is that something that you need to rub into people's faces? I fear that. I don't ever want to do that. I don't ever want to be like that. I've only been saved for 13 years. Only 13 years, going on 14. Okay? Yeah, I've been through the scriptures a few times. But I don't ever want to be rubbing in anyone's face. Oh, I've been saved longer than you. I've read more than you. You know what? I, I've had that thrown uh, done to me. Okay? By people who were so-called elders. And it's like, you make me sick. Shut up. An elder shouldn't act like that. Because what does Eli say here? I said they should speak, and multitude of years should teach wisdom. But look at verse 9. Great men are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. When we were at the altar the one time, this little frail 80-year-old woman, wearing a face mask, who should have known better, looked at my wife and I and like, you should be wearing a face mask. And I looked at this little, frail, elderly woman. I was like, you poor thing. You've probably seen the World War II times. You've probably seen far worse than what, you know, you've probably seen worse. I mean, this is bad, okay? But, of course it's bad. But uh, these, some of these elders, elderly people out there, falling for this kind of stuff? When they are the ones who ought to be standing strong against it? Know what I'm saying? Are you approachable? Hmm? Are you an approachable person? Spirit's own body. Or are you holier than thou? Do you hold the fact of your lifestyle is so different than others that no one can relate to you? Of the church of the living God? See, what you consider living is one way is not the way another of the church of the living God considers living. Two different things. Okay? What you consider poor probably a lot of people would consider to be having great riches. Got to remember these kind of things, brethren, especially in these times. Okay? And ultimately, what happened? In Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42 with these two, with these three friends, okay? They spoke truth. They did, in a false pretense, okay? And Eliu even said of them, it's like, hey, wise older guys should, should speak knowledge. What did God say of these three guys? Job chapter 42, verses 7 and 8. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. Eliu is never addressed. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Said things that are right. They spoke truth, but they didn't speak things that were right. Why? Because they falsely accused Job, and over constant barrage, Job sinned because of their constant barrage. Okay? They didn't hold a gun at Job's head force him to sin? Obviously not. No. But because they were constantly wearing away at him with his barrage, he sinned. He chose to sin. It's like, oh, you guys, shut up! Okay? Yeah! 
Okay, look, look, I've done this, I've done this. They put him on the defensive. Okay, see, that's something that devils do. They will barrage you, barrage you, barrage you to put you on the defensive so you choose to sin and come out looking like a fool. That's a tactic of devils. They'll constantly barrage, barrage, trying to get you to come out of the, out of the corner swinging, sinning, and making yourself look like an idiot. An idiot is void of logic and reason. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So these three guys, who did speak truth, yes they did, we, we looked at some of it, but under a false pretense, okay? So, they spoke truth, but they didn't speak what was right. Very interesting, isn't it? And it is the Lord that declares things that are right. They used truth as a weapon. They weren't using truth aright. Were they? No, they weren't. Now, go to Job chapter 12. Go to Job chapter 12. And during all this barrage that he was getting, Job chapter 12. Look at what Job says. And Job, uh, Job chapter 12, verses 1 under verse 5. Job defending himself. And Job answered and said, No doubt, but ye are the people, and wisdom shall die with you. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not the, such things as these? Job was telling these guys, look, I'm not inferior to you. Why was he telling them that? Oh, because they put themselves up here, talking down to him. When God, when we already know what, God's, what God said of Job himself. But yet they were up here talking down to him. So Job's like, look, I'm not inferior to you. I, are, I know this. Okay? Verse 4. Right here. I am as one mock of his neighbor, who calleth upon God, and he answereth him. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. Now you get a load of that. These three guys were at ease. Elphaz, Bildad, and so far. How perfect is it for you? the church of the living God, when you're at ease to look down on someone when they're suffering and to talk to them in a condescending manner. Shame upon you. Shame upon you. You're going to set yourself up on a pedestal. And while well, I've been doing this for a long time, I've done this. Shut up! Shut up! Just shut up. You know how distasteful that is? You know how grotesque that is? Look at that verse. He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. And look at Job chapter 13, verses 1 under verse 5. Lo, mine eye hath seen all this, mine ear hath heard it heard and understood it. What ye know, the same do I know also. I am not inferior unto you. He had to say, he said that twice. Why? Because they were talking down to him. Surely I would speak to the Almighty and I desire to reason with God. But ye are forgers of lies. Ye are all physicians of no value. Oh, look at this verse. Verse 5. Look at it. Oh, that ye would altogether hold your peace and it should be your wisdom. Oh, that you would shut up and that would be your wisdom. See, they started opening their mouths. That's when all this stuff started happening. Talking down to him. 
And Proverbs chapter 29, one verse, verse 11. Proverbs 29, verse 11. Proverbs 29, verse 11. A fool uttereth all his mind. And a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. But a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. A fool uttereth all his mind. Now go to Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16. Job chapter 16, verses 1 under verse 6. And it, rightfully so. And remember, we already looked. Our Lord said of Job that he spoke what was right while these three didn't. And look what Job says. Then Job answered and said, I have heard many such things. Miserable comforters are ye, are ye all. I don't want to ever hear that. I don't want to ever be that. And brethren, I've, I've been in situations where I've done that before, where I've, op I've done this before, where I've opened my mouth and uh, made things worse but with my best intentions and just destroyed it. I've been there before. Like I said, if the Lord orchestrates something and you're there to comfort someone, shut up. Shut, just shut up. If they ask you, your friend or whatever, your brother, your sister, if they ask you, that's different. But have a little compassion. Have a little tact. Okay? If a rebuke needs to be there, the Lord will guide you to do so. Okay? But if it's in a, uh, in a moment where you're there to be a comfort unto someone, brethren, believe me, some, the worst, one of the worst things you can do is just start blabbing off the mouth, thinking that you're, you know, being up here, talking down, you know? Verse 3, in Job 16. Shall vain words have an end? Or what emboldeneth thee that thou answerest? I also could speak as you as ye do. If your soul were in my soul stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. See, Job was different. But I would strengthen you with my mouth. And the moving of my lips should assuage your grief. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged. And though I forbear, what am I eased? See, they were tearing him apart. And Job said, if I were in the, you know, if I were in your stead, I would try to build you up. I would try to comfort you. You guys, you three putzes are building, are tearing me down. What are they doing? Huh? What are they doing? What, what did we look at? Verse 5 in Job chapter 12. What were they doing? He that is ready to slip with his feet is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. And then Job in chapter 16, verse 4. I could, I also could speak as ye do. If your soul were in my soul's stead, I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. See, Job was different. But I would strengthen you with my mouth. And the moving of my lips would assuage your grief. Job had to tell his three friends that. In the circumstances. Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians. Chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter one. Not first Corinthians, beg your pardon. Second Corinthians chapter one. Ah verses three. 
On to verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 on to verse 11. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Why? See, God will allow you to go through something so when brethren come to you, You've been in that situation before and God could use you to be a source of comfort onto someone. Job kind of alluded to that. You know, if, if I were in your place, I would try to comfort you and lift you up. But see, you guys are breaking me down. And after Job went through that, do you think that he would have been like an Eliphaz, a Bildad, or Zophar? Onto someone who came onto him? You don't think he would have remembered? See, God will put you through something that later on, God will bring someone into your life that because you've been through that yourself, you will be able to comfort someone else with the same comfort that God comforted you. For example, I have gotten quite a few emails about sodomy, about sodomites. Now, granted, I think a lot of them are you, my enemies, uh, especially that one weird kid who was always a Catholic, the racist kid. Uh, I'm not sure of this, but it might be him who keeps sending me uh, pornographic links. But anyway, I, I, I get a lot of people uh, about sodomy because that's something the Lord delivered me from. And there were a few uh, who have emailed me before who I think were legitimate about that and uh the Lord used me to comfort them, you know, about how the Lord got me out of sodomy and whatnot. I went through all of that. And so when someone comes to me legitimately about that, okay, the Lord can use that to comfort someone else or whatever it is through you, with you, okay? God will have us go through something and that comfort that we receive from God in the future, God will use that in us to comfort someone else. See, see, you're going through something. Think, think ahead. Think, think with eternity, with eternity in mind. How you will be able to maybe one day comfort someone who goes through the same affliction that you are. It's not just about you always. Remember. Well, let's continue. Verse seven, and the hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. Why? That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. And as we already looked in Job, do you think that Alphaz, Bildad, and Zophar kind of trusted in their own righteousness and trusted in their own wisdom? I think so. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, pray for one another, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Verse 9, you got to love verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raised up the dead. And also, too, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 
1 Corinthians chapter 10. See, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they didn't consider themselves, meaning they, they were in sin. They didn't speak what was right. They thought with their good intentions, they were doing something good. But in actuality, they were looking down upon Job. They were condescending to him. Not, con not condescending to his low estate like they did when they kept their mouth shut. No, but it's like, oh, you, you poor thing. I'm going to pity you. You've done something wrong. I'm going to flatter you, accuse you, and then poke you. Okay? Just like devils do. But 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 on to verse 15. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. You're so high and mighty. Been there, done that, huh? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. There's this erroneous thing that the Christians like to tell you. God won't give you more than you can handle. That's a lie. Were you looking in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 with me, huh? No, God will purposely give you more than you can handle so you will be broken and not depend upon yourself. No, it's the temptation. The temptation. God will give you more than you can handle so that you do not become self-sufficient. When you have to work in self-sufficient means by goading people on, by talking down to them, rubbing credentials in their face, it's temptation. With every temptation. Temptation. God will make an escape. Brother, sister. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times. When I have chosen. Because all sin is willful sin. Don't forget that. Even with Job. That was willful sin. All sin is willful sin. Okay. You could maybe do something and be ignorant. Not knowing what God says. Okay. Okay. But once you know what God says, and then sin, that's willful sin, okay? So yeah, church of the living God, all sin is willful sin, okay? If you're not saved, you didn't know what the scriptures say, that's different. But you have the church of the living God, you're sin, you sin, it's willful sin, okay? Every time I've chosen to sin, and the Lord will reveal to me, the escape after the fact. When chastening is going on, mind you, but that's the beauty of our Lord. You won't look for that way of escape during that temptation. Then you'll give yourself over to that temptation. Then afterward, when you're feeling sickly, feeling dejected, feeling godly sorrow, God will be like... Uh, Remember that sin you decided to sin against me? Uh, you see this over here? That was the way you could have bear it, bore with it. But you didn't take it, did you? There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted. Above that ye are able. But with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Idolatry. What idolatry? Yourself. Oh, come on. Do you realize that some, with some of you, the biggest idol in your life is yourself? You idolize yourself? Yeah, look at me. I'm talking to you. Yeah. I'm talking to you, whoever you are. Could it be the biggest idol in your life is yourself, the one you look at in the mirror? Why does he say flee from idolatry? Because you've made yourself your, your idol. All that covetousness, you know? The love of money is the root of all evil. All for I, 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 me, me, me. 
What's the idol? Yourself. And look, look what Paul says here. I speak as to wise men. Judge ye what I say. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and verse 5. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Tempted. Tempted how? To get high and mighty? To think more highly of yourself than you ought to think? But also, too, what if you're being tempted to be brought into sin by that brother or sister who um, the Lord that you want, that you're there to restore? Considering yourself, what if that brother is in a sin that you have uh, struggles with yourself? But also there again, beware of pride, brethren. Because when the Lord uses you to comfort someone or the Lord uses you to lead someone onto himself through a vessel such as yourself, through the scriptures, your pride could really quickly go whoop. But then again, you remember Paul. Lest I be exalted above measure with all the revelation. There was a thorn given me in my flesh. Let's continue. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. If you sin, that's your sin. You can't be like, well, it was his fault, like Saul. No, you gotta, you gotta fess up. You gotta own it. You can't blame others for the way you behave. It's not, it's not your wife's fault. It's not your husband's fault. It's not your friend's fault. It's not even the devil's fault. It's your fault. First Peter. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 unto verse 11. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that should be revealed, that shall be revealed, excuse me. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for a filthy lucre, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Being lord over God's heritage. Want a really good example of that? I'll give you one. I'll give you, a, I'll give you the best example of that. Third John, verse 9 and 10. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, or Diotrephes, Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, um, among them, receiveth us not. Diotrephes loves to have the preeminence. This is my church. I say what happened. This is my ministry. I say. Yeah. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, 
and casteth them out of the church. First Peter chapter 5, verse 3 again. Neither being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. A Nicolaitan, which one who rules over the laity. And the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which, you know, the priest class ruling over the uh, la laity, the esoteric and esoteric. One doctrine for those who are not in the know and one for those who are in the know. The doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing our Lord hates. Hey, all you Catholics, you Jesuits, with your ruling priest class, God hates that. Nicolaitism, or Nicolaitanism, he hates it. What are you doing? Can't see that. Neither being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Are you giving an example by being lords over them? And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. Clothed with humility? For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Amen. We're all going through this, brethren, Church of the Living God. You're not an island in that respect. You're living according to God's word, the scriptures, and getting heat for it. Hey, you're not alone, brother, sister. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered for a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The longer you walk with the Lord, the less of yourself you ought to hold in high regard. What do I mean? I'll give you a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. One verse. Verse 1. For in much wisdom is much grief, much fear of the Lord. Wisdom. And he said unto man, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. You know what that means? The longer you walk with the Lord, the longer you, you walk with our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, the less arrogant you ought to be. Well, we all know that. Yeah, I know. I know you know that. I know you know that. But see, as Job, Job 42, verses 1 on to verse 6, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore, right here, there it is. Wherefore, I abhor myself 
extreme hatred. That's what abhor means. Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. The more you read the scripture, the more you hate yourself. The more you walk with our Lord, the more inadequate you are becoming of yourself. The more aware of your frailty you become, the longer you walk with our Lord. The more dependent you are upon the Lord because you know that you're scum. The longer you walk with the Lord, the more you hate yourself. The longer you walk with the Lord, the more you loathe the thought of you. The more you read this, the more you hate yourself because you know you can't live it up. For in much wisdom is much grief, and he that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. That's why the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is so beautiful. That's why Paul says in uh, Romans chapter uh, in Romans chapter seven. Okay, that's why he says Romans chapter seven, verses twenty four and twenty five. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. God came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. And when you got someone who's been saved for many years, so they claim, or been a Christian for 25, 30 years, and they're puffed up, and they're willing to tell you how blessed they are, rather than to shut up and be a comforter unto you, you need to be aware, beware of those people and get away from them. The more you stay in this book, the less, the less arrogant, the less puffed up you will become. You'll become puffed up. It happens. But see, God will chasten you and correct you and rebuke you. Because, hey, hello, like I've told you, I've got a pride problem. Then when my pride gets rearing up in me like a flare back of hemorrhoids, boy, oh, all kinds of things start to happen. But see, that's when I get down on my knees. Lord, this is my fault. I chose to sin against you. This is my pride. Have mercy upon me, a sinner who is chief. And I accept, I accept your punishment, Lord. What can I do? I deserve this. I deserve worse. Like uh, my best friend says, ask him how he's doing better than I deserve. Amen, brother. Amen. Amen. Am I making you feel a little uh, uneasy? Good. 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 We mustn't forget compassion in these days, brethren. I know, I believe, believe me, I know what it's like out there. <laughs> but we can't forget compassion. We can't. Go to Job 19. Job 19, verses 1 on to verse 22. Then Job answered and said, How long will ye vex my soul and break me in pieces with words? Which is exactly what they were doing. And because of that, Job sinned. Okay? It wasn't their fault. They weren't holding a gun at Job's head. Job willfully sinned and puffing himself and boasting. But this is why. Because of the constant barrage that he received from his three friends. That's what enemies do to us. These coadjutors, they want to constantly barrage you, to weaken you, to get you into a corner so that you come out and sin and they laugh at you because they got you to sin. These ten times have ye reproached me. Ye are not ashamed that ye you make yourself strange to me? And, it, and be it indeed that I have erred. Mine error remaineth with myself. Every man will bear his own burden, remember? 
If indeed ye will magnify yourselves against me, which they were doing, and plead against me my reproach, <laughs> know, know now that God hath overthrown me, and hath compassed me with his net. <laughs> yeah, God is against me, and you guys are just making it worse by being against me too. Behold, I cry out of wrong, but I am not heard. I cry aloud, but there is no judgment. He hath fenced up my way that I cannot pass, and he hath set darkness in my paths. He hath stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He hath destroyed me on every side, and I am gone, and my hope hath he removed like a tree. He hath also kindled his wrath against me, and he counteth me unto him as one of his enemies. You notice I'm enunciating the he's and stuff like that. Yes. His troops can come together and raise up their way against me and encamp round about my tabernacle. He hath put my brethren far from me, and mine acquaintance are verily estranged from me. My kinsfolk have failed me, and my familiar friends have forgotten me. This is the, the mind and the heart of a broken man. You talk about desolation of a man. You ever been here, brother, sister? They that dwell in mine house and my maids count me for a stranger. I am an alien in their sight. I called my servant, and he gave me no answer. I entreated him with my mouth. My breath is strange to my wife, though I entreated for the children's sake of mine own body. So bad when even your own wife is against you. Hold your place here. Go to Micah. Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7. Verses 5 under verse 7. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in God. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy, own, in thy bosom. Talking about your wife. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Man's enemies are the men of his own house. Ultimately, and here's the, cur and here's the encouragement, therefore will I look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Verse 18 in Job 19. Yea, young children despised me. I arose, and they spake against me. And we saw that children are supposed to give respect unto the elders. My bone cleaveth to my skin. My bone cleaveth to my skin and to my flesh, and I am escaped with the skin of my teeth. Have pity upon me. Have pity upon me, O ye my friends, for the hand of God hath touched me. Why do ye persecute me as God and are not satisfied with my flesh? See, right there, they were constantly barraging him when they should have just shut up and been there for him, like they did at the first. But see, you open up your mouth sometimes, and it is as if, if someone is going through suffering, and you, hot shot, want to be the big guy, throw a sermon on him, instead of just letting him cry on your shoulder for a while. But are you a touch freak and don't want to do that, right? Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. I thought this was meat. I thought this was meat. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 17. Unto the close of the chapter. This I say therefore. And testify in the Lord. That ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. In the vanity of their mind. Kind of like Eliphaz, Bildad and so far. Having the understanding darkened, 
being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. How can you easy believism devils comfort one another? With, other than, doesn't affect your salvation, and you're all going to hell anyway. <laughs> Talk about some miserable comforters, I can only imagine. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, and the Holy Ghost is that spirit. How do you hear Jesus through the scriptures? How do you get taught by Jesus through the scriptures? Jesus, okay? The Lord is that spirit, okay? Remember, the Godhead, spirit, soul, and body. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. God the Father is the soul. The Word made flesh is the body. And the Lord is that spirit. It's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, you know? One God, spirit, soul, and body, okay? That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry. And sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. How do you give place to the devil? Being angry in sin. Uh, do you think Job was angry at the constant barrage? Yeah. And what happened in Job's anger? In Job's anger, he sinned. Did you not read with me in Job 19? That was a man of dis despair, anger. Yeah, his three friends, who were doing good at the first, decided to open up their big mouths and make it worse. But they were, they were basically just peeing on his foot as well. Okay? So, in Job, of course that got to him. And he gave place to the devil, and he sinned. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Corrupt, putrid, decaying, rotten, rank, rancid. Like the doctrine of easy believism. The love him into the kingdom, the love gospel, the ecumenical toilet paper. But that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister, minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption, once saved, always saved. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away with you, put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Now see, unlike when you read in the gospel accounts before the death, burial, and resurrection, during the kingdom of heaven, if you do not forgive someone, you're not going to be forgiven. Hence, works during the kingdom of heaven. Today, nowadays, in this dispensation, once you are sealed, you're saved, you're sealed until the day of redemption. The Holy Ghost, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, lives in you. Okay, you're going to heaven. Uh, you, as a church of the living God, you can hold a grudge. You can be angry at someone and hold a grudge and not forgive someone. It will not affect your salvation. But it'll affect your testimony, it'll affect your walk, it'll affect your life, it'll affect your mind, it'll affect your relationship with the Lord. No, your salvation will not be affected, no. But everything else will be. See. 
like I said, there are those of the Church of the Living God that I do not like. There are those of the Church of the Living God who I do not like, who have brought things against me which were not true. I forgive them. I love them. They are my brethren and sisters. I might not like you, but if you are of the Church of the Living God, you are my brother or my sister. And... And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That doesn't mean that if you had fellowship once before that you're going to get back in fellowship. No, no. Usually, most of the time, that means the opposite. But see, again, if you hold on to a grudge, if you just won't let it go, you just won't let it go. You got to keep dredging it up. You got to keep scratching the wound. You can't just leave one and two admonitions and then go away. No, you got to do a thousand. Yeah. Finally, 1 Peter chapter 3. Then we'll be done. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 on to verse 12. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Don't be like the three friends, <laughs> three friends of Job. Don't be high-minded. Not rendering evil for evil, but railing or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and that his lips, and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Sound familiar to what God said of Job, doesn't it? For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. There you go. Yeah, that's um, that's one thing I don't ever want to. I don't ever want to forget where I came from. What the Lord saved me from. How the Lord had has had compassion on me. And granted, like I've said, that that has cost me before. I've given compassion and put my hand out to people who I should have never have done so. I've given chances upon chances to people who I should have never have done so. Who took those chances and <coughs> stabbed me in the back. You live and learn. But see, you mustn't let those things harden you to the point where you become an Eliphaz, a Bildad, or so far. And you can't let these things of the world puff you up to put you down here to where you can't relate to the guys at the bottom of the totem pole. Give me a break, man. That makes me sick. I'd rather be with the guys at the bottom because our God is the God of the little people rather than be with the upper echelons. I'd rather be down there than up there. I'd rather be uh, with the lowly than those who pat each other on their back. And I hope you are too. I hope so too. It's going to be it for this video, brethren. Um, this, is something, uh, this is something that I'm very passionate about. And um, like I've said, I've seen so many examples of this where people have been so puffed up, so arrogant. And I've seen 
people who have been in miseries. And then you got some putts coming, rubbing their credentials about how great God has been for them. While all they need to is someone to cry on. And they blow it. And I've done that too. And I don't ever want to do that again. Hopefully this will help. Hopefully this will encourage. Hopefully this may rebuke a few of you. I don't know. But um, hopefully this helps. This is what the Lord wanted me to speak today. Today is the 20th. Um, got some personal things going on. Uh, next week, next week is going to be a beautiful, hard, thankful week. Um, it's going to be hard. It's going to be beautiful. But um, I might be not doing a video for a little while because we have some personal things here at home that needing to tend to. Some things going on with my wife. Um, we are actually going to find out what it is that is ailing her. Lord willing. So keep your keep your sister, my wife, in your prayers for that, please. Um, please. And also uh, our brother, our best friend, Lord willing, is going to be joining us next week. So um, next week is going to be a very busy week for us here. Uh, lots of stuff going on next week. So um, a video might not be coming for a while, just so you know. Okay. You can still, of course, get a hold of me through email and whatnot. And we, you never know what the Lord will have done. But I'm just letting you know that um, because what's coming up next week might be away for a little while. Just a little while. Not too long. Not too long. But so we can tend to things here. Uh, my wife really needs me. And we really need your prayers. So thank you. Thank you so very much, all of you. Praise the Lord for all of you. I know Paul did gave a list of people who he thanked, but you know, if I think if I publicly thank you by name for those of you whom the Lord has used to give unto our necessity, you have your reward. But you know who you are. And the Lord reward every single one of you your faithfulness and your and how you've been there for us. May the Lord be there for you and bless you. It's going to be it for this video. Thank you, brethren. We love you. We pray for you. And remember, when, when I tell you we pray for you, we pray for you. What about you? It's going to be it. I'm going to get this uploaded. It's uh, 2.35 p.m. my time, so we'll see what happens. Thank you so much. We love you. We'll see you in the very next video.